Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back into the studio. We're back in the studio after last week's mini tour of the city of Florence. I hope you enjoyed that. But today we are back making sculptures. More specifically, the sculpture of Saturn devouring his child. Now I don't know if that's going to be the final name or not, but for now it'll, it'll have to do. So let's start off with talking about the things happening on the screen. The main structures have been built, have been sculpted, the main structure being the torso for the most part. The figure is pretty much in the pose they'll end up being in. Now I can add the elements that take up a lot of attention, like the head. But without the torso being structurally sound, I don't feel comfortable putting a head on there. If I was sculpting a larger scale sculpture, I would do exactly the same thing. I might actually hesitate even more. Just because sculpting a nice head on top of a torso that needs to be changed is likely to compromise the sculpting of the head and that turns into a mess real fast with a lot of backtracking, which is annoying. People have different opinions on this though and, and different ways of dealing with this but I prefer to be patient and make sure the torso is at a stage where I feel comfortable that there won't be any major changes happening to it. As you can see the legs have been established too. In most cases, the legs are a major part of carrying the weight of the figure. Even though in this case, a lot of the weight is carried by the fact that he is sitting. He's kind of half sitting, semi sitting, almost ready to spring into action. And so the legs do play a major role in creating that sort of dynamic. So they need to be there and they need to be well established at an early stage. Notice that the head is blocked in just as a profile, just like a pancake or, or a very narrow version of the final head. And I do the same thing when I sculpt larger scale sculpture, you've seen this before. The portrait starts out with the profile. In this case it's a lot looser as there's no, there's no real attempt at any likeness or even really an, any attempt at creating a, a realistic version of a face. I just want there to be a, the visual impression of a face to be there really. Most of the work is still done with my hands, and essentially I'm just expanding on the work that's already been done. Meaning that what's been set up, I'm not going to mess with too much, but I'm adding small pieces of clay on top of what's already been established. Adding anatomical details, or tweaking the contour, adding volume to the three-quarter view for example. A quick word from our sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online video learning platform where you can learn virtually anything from baking to photography to painting. My viewers get a two month trial for free. So if you're interested in learning something new, click the Skillshare link in the description below and sign up. This is all real time footage. And if you look closely, you can see that I tend to take a piece of clay roll it between my fingers into a sausage shape, kind of a sausage shape, and then I'll add it to the sculpture in the direction that the form is traveling in. I kind of pull the piece of clay along the form, with the form. The pieces of clay are not just pressed into the surface, like flat dots. I think if you do it that way, at any scale really, the sculpture becomes very difficult to read, tougher to look at and understand what it is that you are looking at. I'm always trying to make things as easy as possible for myself. So even though the surface of the sculpture at this stage is rough, the pieces of clay are pulled in the direction of the form, which means they represent the form that would be there on a human model, visually, even though I'm not using a model in this case. Essentially, it just makes every form easily identifiable. Painters and draftsmen use the same trick when they move the brush or the pencil, around the form, creating an illusion of the form turning. Except here, it's not an illusion. But it helps with the visual impression from a distance and makes everything just a little bit easier on the eyes, a little bit easier for you to see. So it's a good trick and something that I would recommend everyone do. Referring back to my nine tips to make your sculpture better video, I'm kind of in the stage where I worry about tip number five here, symmetry in internal information. So as I'm blocking in internal information, I pay attention to the symmetry. 
And I also notice where I can or should deviate from, from this rule. An example would be in the length of the obliques. Because of the tilt between the ribcage and the pelvis, one oblique is compressed or squeezed together while the other is stretched out. So they do not occupy the exact same space as far as height goes, so they can't be symmetrical. The bottom of the ribcage will also have asymmetries because on the extended side of the body, the bottom part of the ribcage is exposed, while on the compressed side of the body, the bottom part of the ribcage is diving underneath the flesh of the oblique and disappears from view. So as you can see, there's always exceptions to, to every rule. But for example, on the chest, there is symmetry in the bones, and I'm trying to emphasize that so that tip number six, symmetry and structure in bony areas to support organic forms, is respected and given the proper attention to ensure a satisfactory result. This, I think, is a good time to mention Patreon. If you are interested in learning sculpture from me personally and get feedback on your work either on email or via video chat, Patreon is the place for you. You'll get in-depth feedback on techniques and how you can apply them to your own work. Anything sculpture related goes, we can talk about armature, supplies, mold making, anything you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, there's a link in the description below. Okay, let's talk about iterating on a design. Now, this maquette is not even done yet, at, at least not here on YouTube, but in real life it's been done for a few weeks. And I've done a lot of looking at it and I've done a lot of, of thinking since then. One of the unforeseen positive effects of having a lot of time in between when the first iteration of the design is made and when the large scale version is to be made is that I get to consider other options. What will hopefully be improvements? Now, some of these are going to be motivated by what I want to convey with the piece, and others are merely design and compositional considerations. Let's speak about a few things I plan to change while we're here, even though we're not even done yet, but let's do it anyway. So the plan that I've come up with is to make a second maquette, a larger one, probably one third or one quarter scale, around 40 to 50 centimeters tall or 15 to 20 inches if you're empirically inclined. The hope is that this second maquette will be a closer representation of what I intend the final sculpture to be. So it'll be a little bit more rendered than this one, not as loose. The final sculpture that I want to make will be larger than life, 225 centimeters tall or 88 inches if you're empirically inclined. So it's a lot bigger than anything else I've made and require a lot more planning. I've recently spent quite a bit of time in my off time studying Michelangelo and he was always very very well prepared for every project he did it seems. So I want to try and emulate that level of preparation to the best of my abilities to hopefully end up with the best final result that I'm capable of and not undermine myself before I've even begun. So a couple of changes that I'm fairly certain that I'm going to make. The legs need to be reconsidered for sure. I don't like that they cross over each other as much as they ended up doing. I think working from life and getting some proper reference will help me solve this for sure. One thing that I like a lot and want to emphasize and push is the feeling of dynamic tension. As if the figure is about to come alive and stand up. He's just noticed us and he is mere seconds from making his decision. Now by pushing one leg slightly further back, giving the feeling that he's milliseconds from pushing off that leg and standing up, I, ho I hope to achieve this effect. It's definitely not a new idea, I've seen this effect applied several times, especially by Michelangelo, and he's done this in several pieces. Now the one that springs to mind first is Moses, where he does this exact same thing. And it allows you to have a seated pose, or a semi-seated pose in my case, and still have the figure be on the brink of action, which creates enormous tension, enormous potential. 
Second change I feel fairly certain of is redesigning the half-eaten figure. This is where the motivation for iteration comes not only from wanting a more interesting pose or more interesting composition, but from a conceptual standpoint. Michelangelo has been a major theme for me this summer, a major theme of study, and so we're continuing down the same path by learning from the greatest sculptor to ever live. The limp figure in Saturn's arm doesn't do much for me. I, I agree it's, it's horrifying, yes, but that's really about it. I don't know how excited I am to sculpt such a figure, completely devoid of life. And I don't really think it fits the story I want to tell either. So in my story, fate will be fighting back. Instead of making the figure limp, I want to make the figure active, mirroring Saturn's about to be active pose. With the legs in very much the same configuration, one pulled back ready to push the body off Saturn's lap. I also want to try something I haven't attempted before, which is a dynamic figure fusion, which is just a fancy way of saying that I want to take the ribcage and the pelvis and twist them more than what a model would be able to hold for me. The way to do this is to sculpt the ribcage and the pelvis from separate views and then attaching them together by sculpting the middle section of the torso where the ribcage and pelvis meet from imagination. The one arm that's not being eaten, I'm not entirely sure what to do with yet, but perhaps touching the arm of Saturn's in pity and not fighting back would be an interesting decision. Like the figure has some sort of conflicting emotion about what's going on. The figure of Saturn's child, which is really going to be an adult, actually it's not even going to be a son, it'll be a daughter. The plan is to have my, my girlfriend model for me, which perhaps sounds a bit morbid, but don't worry, I, th I think she's pretty excited about it. The Eaton figure will be a close resemblance of Michelangelo's Libyan Sibyl, which is a figure he painted on the Sistine ceiling. Not only will my Eaton figure, half Eaton figure, be inspired by the Libyan Sibyl in pose, I think it fits really well as far as concept goes as well, which I thought was really really cool and really interesting when I found that out recently. The Sibyls were soothsayers, fortune tellers. The ancient Greek word Sibylla means prophetess. Now I don't know if I pronounced Sibylla, which is a Greek word correctly, but bear with me. In classical mythology, the Libyan Sibyl foretold the coming of the days when that which is hidden shall be revealed. Saturn is devouring his fate, his future in the form of an oracle but fate is inescapable and it never rests. The figure of Saturn's child will be twisting in his arms, fighting to break free, but perhaps conflicted at the same time for the love of her master and the sadness for what he has become. Sometimes these ideas can come by allowing yourself time for the idea to mature. I've had the idea for this sculpture for ages, but not until I made the first iteration of the maquette was I able to see my idea and reiterate on it. And I think by perhaps sculpting the maquette, I kind of freed myself from my own vision of what I wanted this sculpture to be by essentially realizing that vision in clay. The first iteration was very much based on Goya's painting. By creating it, giving myself ample time to think and redesign, I think I'm coming up with an idea that's way more of my own. Or at least perhaps more of an amalgamation of several influences rather than just really heavily influenced by one influence. So what I think I've learned and discovered this time around is to let things mature properly every time and not rush into something. Let the design and the idea breathe for a while. Spend time researching better options than the one you were able to first come up with. Worst case scenario, you exhaust the options and come back around to where you started, but then at least no stone was left unturned. Or perhaps you discover something that improves the piece you had in mind, something that clarifies your idea and allows you to communicate what you wish more clearly. 
Then there is of course the argument that by allowing time to redesign and reconsider, it'll taint your original idea. So I suppose there's always two sides to any coin. If you enjoyed the video and want to learn sculpture from me, check out my Patreon page. I give feedback and critiques on people's work and we talk about whatever you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, the link is in the description below. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for a new video next Thursday. Hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button and share with your friends and family. It really helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching, stay creative and I hope to see you in the next one.